Uh, so we are very privileged here to have a, a fantastic lineup of all the leading foundations in the documentary world. Uh, just, I'm David Alamuti, I'm the session producer. Uh, just to give you a bit of insight, uh, foundations are becoming, as a landscape of documentary changes, foundation funding uh, is becoming a, a big part of, of a documentary's life cycle. Uh, and that's having a big impact on the sorts of documentaries that can get made, but also on some of the other critical issues. Uh, so today we're going to really sort of take this apart and look at the foundation structure and environment. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Jennifer Merrin, who is our chair. And the way that the panel will run is every panelist will introduce themselves. Uh, and then Jennifer will ask some questions and then we'll open up to the floor uh, for you to have a chance to ask some questions also. So hello, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. I just wanted to ask, so that everyone on the panel knows, how many of the people in the audience are actually filmmakers? So we have a lot of, a lot of filmmakers here who will have questions in the end uh, to ask. Um, the first person who's speaking today is Victoria Steventon from the Influence Film Fund. Um, the purpose of this is a general, very brief introduction. Um, each person will say who they are, what they do at the foundation, what the foundation looks for, and, and how you contact them, very simply. So take it, Victoria, please. Hello. Um, I, my name is Victoria. I set up Influence Film Foundation about two years ago um, in the belief that there was a real lack of European foundations to help uh, with documentary funding. Um, I <clears throat> hope to drive philanthropy to support documentaries and filmmakers, making a variety of different documentaries, um, human issue, social issue, but not campaigning, some impact, um, but we're just really looking for fantastic stories, feature length with theatrical ambitions. We come in fairly late on in production. We would want to see scenes, trailers, worked up treatments, budgets, the sort of the usual, and... Um, we grant to about five, between five and 10 uh, films a year, up to about 20,000 pounds per grant. I think that's it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we next have Bruni Burris, who's here from Sundance. Hello, um, I'm Bruni Burris, and I'm a senior consultant with the Sundance Documentary Program and Fund. And the Sundance Documentary Program and Fund, it's been in existence now for 10 years at Sundance, and it originally came from the Soros Foundation, which um, is a fund that supports documentary, feature-length documentaries, um, that highlight and uh, focus on contemporary social and human rights issues. We grant and support films in both the development, but I would say the kind of late development stages, as well as the post-production stages. We um, support films, filmmakers, independent projects, character-driven, um, with a, a very strong story that, like Victoria said, not advocacy films. We're quite interested in films and how filmmakers are interested to work with their projects to engage different audiences and make um, social change, but that they are independently great works of art. We also have, throughout the year, ongoing labs, which are creative labs in editing, sound composition for documentaries, as well as creative producing, that are available for grantees. And we also, because there's a few people in the audience who we work with, um, work very closely with local, regional um, initiatives around the globe, such as an initiative in Asia and Taipei and China called Synex. We also work with a wonderful development program that's um, based in the Middle East. It's called Greenhouse, and one of our filmmakers um, who went through the program said is here. And we also do a lot of programs in, in um, Latin America, working with both Chile Doc and Doc Buenos Aires. And then I'd love to hear your questions, but I think that's good to leave it there for now. Okay, uh, thanks, Bruni. Next we have Adela Lajavardi from Cinereach. Thank you. Um, so my name is Adela Lajavardi. I'm the grants manager at Cinereach. It's a New York-based nonprofit organization founded in 2006. Um, we fund, well, there are three arms to the company, productions, grants, and fellowships, um, and I deal with the grants department. Um, in the grants department, we fund feature-length documentary and fiction films, also hybrids now, um, that are, we define feature-length 70 minutes or longer. Um, we fund all stages of the production from development through post-production. Uh, we're not currently funding distribution or outreach. Um, 
we our grant ranges are from five to fifty thousand uh, dollars per project. Um, the uh, mission of the organization is to fund vital stories artfully told. Um, we're very interested in the craft of the storytelling, how you're using the um, the, the medium of film video um, to tell your story with intent um, and how that might mirror the content. Um, I think that's it. We provide all sorts of additional resources to the filmmakers uh, beyond just the grant, and we're interested in films and filmmakers that are taking creative risks. Uh, next, we have Sally Ann Masterson from Worldview. Uh, it's Sally Ann Wilson, um, oh. <laughs> um, and I'm Secretary General of an organization called the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association, which is the largest global association of public broadcasters, so uh, BBC, ABC Australia, SBS, CBC Canada, and um, over 100 smaller broadcasters globally. And within that network, 12 years ago, we set up Worldview, um, and I'm the project director of Worldview. Uh, since we launched 12 years ago, then Worldview has funded, uh, development funding is what we provide, occasionally completion, occasionally outreach, but mainly very early development. And we've funded 418 docs. Many have gone on to be Emmy winners, um, two Oscar nominations, and we've actually partnered with a lot of the foundations um, on this table in the past and continue to do so. Um, what we do is what we say we do. It's worldview. It's about creating um, a, a more balanced worldview to audiences everywhere. It's enabling filmmakers to tell global stories. So we're interested in any subject, but it has to be a global story. Um, telling stories about parts of the world that don't often get covered. Um, in a 24-7 news world, then we often get perceptions of particularly continent of Africa is one where, you, you know, there's a very grim and gloomy perception that we get through our news media. And we feel that documentaries are a great place to contextualize that with real life stories. Um, so we provide the seed funding, mainly factual. We do do some uh, drama docs um, and some animations, and we've even done comedy in the past. But our, our core of our work is the big feature docs, um, Afghan Star, Moving to Mars, Five Broken Cameras, um, as I say, many over recent years. Um, and all our contact details will be available. We're based in the UK, and uh, we'd love to hear from you if you've got an international idea. Thank you very much. Uh, and next is Sarah Masters from the Hartley Film Fund. <clears throat> Hartley Film Foundation was established Foundation. in 1979. Um, it has uh, developed into a program that provides seed grants, just development grants. We don't do produ production or outreach. Uh, for films that focus on themes, feature length documentaries, character driven, narratives that focus on world religions. Um, for example, Jihad for Love about gay or lesbian Muslims in communities where they're persecuted or uh, three judges about uh, three women who are judges on Sharia courts in the West Bank or sister about some of the nuns in America who are being investigated by the Vatican for the good social work that they do or the comedy Deli Man about, about the delicatessen People, the people who run delicatessens in the United States and the whole history of food in the Jewish religion. So uh, we also have a robust fiscal sponsorship program um, for our fiscal, pro fiscal sponsees. We provide uh, funding so that they can um, do individual consultations with a communication strategy team out of San Francisco, um, Active Voice. Uh, they can uh, uh, strategize about their outreach programs, uh, who to partner with, and um, how to reach the grassroots organizations that not only will further the reach of their film, but also act upon the message of their films. Um, we're certainly trying, we certainly believe that there's a lot of misunderstanding today and that the source of a lot of conflict in the world has to do with religion. So that's what we're about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jose Rodriguez from Tribeca Film Institute. Hi, I'm Jose. I'm the manager of documentary programming for the Tribeca Film Institute. Um, we at TFI have over six funds. Four of them are documentary um, under the documentary programming department. 
And what we do is very unique in that each of our funds has a specific focus and approach. Some of them are, are filmmaker uh, pertinent to the filmmaker him, himself or herself, and the other ones are thematic in terms of subject matter. We focus on particular types of themes. Um, of those four, two of them are international in scope, and they're kind of very polar opposites in what we look for. So we really want to support as much, as much of a range in terms of subject matter as possible. Um, we have one fund that's kind of our, our the, st the longest running fund that we have documentary wise is the Gucci Tribeca Documentary Fund. Um, it's very much a social justice oriented social issue f fund. Um, basically looking for current social issues that are affecting the world today, all around the world, and looking for, fi for stories that should get more, more prominence and exposure in the media, but aren't because for whatever reason are not being addressed. We wanna find those stories with you know, dramatic stakes, um, epic, you know, large scale social issues. Um, Rafia Solar Mama and God Loves Uganda are examples of films we funded that are you know, at Sheffield. Um, on the opposite extreme of that is the TFI Documentary Fund, and it serves as very much like an antithesis to the Gucci Fund in that we're looking for character-driven genre documentaries. You know, in the past, we've kind of have been unable to kind of categorize what this fund is about because people, filmmakers such as yourselves, get confused in what, what subject matter we look for, but they're very much targeting pop culture aspects of daily life, whether it's a music documentary, a sports documentary, um, having to do with arts and culture. But the story emanates out of a subject or a set of subjects, and, and the, sto the story emanates out of them, but yet we're following the lives and the actions of a set of subjects and uh, characters. Um, actually, tonight, I believe, or tomorrow, 979, Daniel Gordon's documentary about Ben Johnson, the doping scandal in so Seoul, Seoul Olympics. That's one of the funds, that, one of the projects that we funded through the TFI Doc Fund. Um, as opposed to, apart from those two, we have two other funds, um, and they're very much very specific in terms of what we're trying to cater towards. We have a Latin fund that's exclusively for Latin America filmmakers, um, specifically those that live in the Caribbean, Central, you know, South America, Mexico. And actually, we've partnered with Worldview. We have a, a partnership in place where we provide grants to filmmakers with a project in development through post or, or production. Um, and that's a partnership that we put in place this year. And this Latin fund, we're happy to report that it's become bigger and bigger because we're targeting more and more filmmakers throughout Latin America. And then the last fund that we have is uh, our flagship program, and we specifically focus on the US and Canada and Puerto Rico, and we're looking for statistically underrepresented filmmakers in the industry, which means we're looking to support diverse voices, men and women of color, women filmmakers. Um, that's the Tribeca All Access program. Um, so in a way, we're very much targeting as many audiences, as many filmmakers, as many subject matters as possible. But the overarching theme is that we're looking for feature length, 70 plus, um, with the theatrical potential. Thank you very much. Uh, and next we have Rebecca, Rebecca Lichtenfeld from the Bertha Foundation. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca, or Becky. And um, I manage uh, the media portfolio for the Bertha Foundation. So in terms of um, our funding for documentary films, because that's the most relevant, we um, we do it primarily through four different funds, um, two of which I work very closely with Luke here. Um, we have the Bertha Brit Doc Journalism Fund, which is for feature-length documentaries that have investigative journalism at the core um, essence of, of what they're working on. And those grants range from five to 50,000 pounds. And then there's also the Bertha Brit Doc Connect Fund, um, which which is strictly for outreach around feature docs. Um, and then separately from that, we we have the IDFA Bertha Fund, which is um, based out of Amsterdam, and that's for filmmakers from the developing world. And that can be development grants or production grants, and um, you can apply to that two times a year. Um, and then finally, the Bertha Foundation does do direct granting for films that we feel we would like to support that don't fit into any of those funds. Those are smaller sized grants and those are more discretionary. Um, 
And basically, this is a family foundation who believes um, that media has the power to affect change um, when used in, in a particular way. And they like to go where other funders won't go and sort of they pride themselves in sort of trying to fund things that aren't necessarily going to make lots of money but are, are going to make a big change if possible. Excellent. Uh, and next we have Luke Moody from Brit Docs. Yes, Brit, Hello, Brit Doc. No, Brit Doc. Sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Luke Moody from Brit Doc Foundation. I'm the grants officer there. Um, mm. We have, uh, we're a non-profit foundation in existence to support feature-length documentary, to find new ways of, of creating partnerships around docu uh, feature-length documentary for funding for outreach also, um, and we have five different funds, two of which um, Bex touched upon. Uh, those are the Birth of Brit Doc Journalism Fund. There are a couple of films showing here at the festival this week that I urge you to see. Um, Pussy Riot, which opened last night, and also Dirty Wars, I think is screening today, a great film. Um, and then the Birth of Brit Doc Connect Fund also, which is, is for kind of new forms of outreach, um, ways to get your film out there that, that aren't just kind of traditional routes of distribution, but they're more kind of tactical means of reaching a particular audience that you want to affect, uh, getting partners involved around that distribution. Um, and that one has two, two open calls a year. The Birth of the Brick Doc Journalism Fund is a rolling fund, so you can apply any time. Um, then we have our kind of founding fund, which was a Channel 4 fund open only to British filmmakers. Uh, it's for feature length, documentaries, very independent voices. They can be quite creative films. We've spotted kind of artist documentary like Gillian Waring, Andrew Cotting recently, um, and much more kind of social issue films like The End of the Line. Uh, and that one, it's, it's mainly for production, but also kind of you can apply at rough cut stage and we take quite an active role exec producing those projects. We also have the Puma Catalyst Award, which some of you might have heard of, but it's undergone some changes recently used to be just a de development fund of 5,000 euros and, and quite broad criteria, but it's changed to be a 5,000 euro injection, a catalytic injection at pretty much any point of the film. And we have uh, not so specific criteria, but some, some thematics that we, we want the films to, to touch upon. Um, I can read a few out, but there are quite a, maybe I won't, I'll save that for later. You can check it on the website anyway. It's all available on the website. It's, it's all on the website, Britdoc.org. Um, yeah. And then last week we just announced the BritDoc Circle Fund, which is a brand new European fund for European feature-length documentaries. Uh, just the best artistic and journalistic documentaries out there, and it's for production. At the moment it's not open, it's not open application. We'll be finding projects at things like Meat Market for that one. We also do Good Pitch, uh, which is a forum that we just had on last Thursday, I think it was. Good Pitch UK, but that's gone international. We have uh, two Good Pitches in North America, and we have Good Pitch Squared, which is a kind of a smaller version of the forum that next year there'll be one in Mumbai, uh, possibly Beijing, and so this moves around. We had one in Johannesburg that was really effective. Um, and the Good Pitch basically brings together alternative partners for film, be it philanthropists, brands, NGOs, people c who can help you in, in different ways that's not just giving you a paycheck, it, it's kind of um, helping the film get out there and reach different kinds of audiences. Excellent, thank you, Luke. And lastly, we have Catherine Round from Dockheads. Hello, I'm Catherine from Dockheads. I'm one of the co-founders of Dockheads. Um, Dockheads is actually a new, um, certainly in comparison to a lot of the people around this table, a new um, fund. We're um, a post-production equity fund. Um, our role is to get involved um, in financing uh, documentaries, um, essentially with the power to reach a very wide audience. Um, I mean, the, the reason that this fund was set up was because um, basically, you know, in, in this sort of evolving TV landscape, we felt that there were a lot, of, um, a lot of films that did eventually make it onto television, but that was obviously quite a battle often, um, and that we really wanted to be able to help with um, shortfall, shortfalls in funding for ambitious films, films that aim to go out on television and films that aim to have a theatrical release as well. Um, Often these films are considered quite high risk, although, you know, obviously we think that, you know, actually there should be more of these films uh, being commissioned. Um, so really what we support is uh, one-off documentaries. Um, they, they need to have 
quite outstanding talent attached, be that on screen or behind the camera. Um, you know, the usual, we're looking for compelling stories, but we're not looking for any particular, we don't have a particular remit, we're, we're not totally fo focused on social justice, we're not totally focused on um, archive, we're not totally focused on traditional, um, we actually just want you to bring us the best stories or the best way of looking at issues, new ways of looking at issues, new people, um, innovative approaches are obviously a big, a, a big part of what we do, um, you know, we want to you know, we, we really want to find new ways to tell these stories and we want to really support filmmakers who are kind of pushing, pushing the sort of boundaries of, of, of how to make a great film. Um, we, we look for both films that can work on, on TV, a TV hour and also a feature length version. Um, you know, we, we want films that can kind of have a long lifespan, you know, not just a one-off television broadcast, but something that can really kind of travel and sort of play, in, play across the global markets. Um, our fund is, is to cover post. Um, we don't cover production, we don't cover outreach, sadly. Um, so we tend to look at projects that are either in the late stage of production or er often early post we can get involved in. We can get involved at earlier stages. Um, we can provide letters of intent. Um, we just obviously need to put together a, a, a plan, a financing plan of how you're going to get to the sort of post stage. Um, I mean, other conditions, um, you know, we, we look, obviously we look for um, you know, a post-production entity behind the film that has delivered films like this in the past. Um, you know, this could mean pairing up with a, a sort of established production company if you're not already established production company. We look already to see that there is some broadcaster interest in it. This could be um, any, it doesn't have to be UK broadcaster or US broadcaster, we're just looking for a sort of major international broadcaster to be on, on board. Um, you know, we, we ideally look for subjects that have a wide appeal. Um, we're not specific about what that appeal might be. Oh, I've I'm, I'm, I'm run, um, run out of time. Um, and I think that's it, really. I mean, you know, we're looking for ambitious projects that really, with our help, could, could realise their full potential. OK, so what we have here is uh, we have the major, one of the major uh, power uh, house uh, <laughs> effects here in documentary filmmaking. These these particular people wield a tremendous amount of power uh, when it comes to getting films either made or not made. I am not a filmmaker. I am a film journalist. Um, you should know that my background has been, I've been very outspoken against things like corporate funding of documentary. I think it's a bad thing. And uh, I've been very concerned about how funding of documentary actually may influence the shape of documentary in terms of the public interest. My purpose here is to serve the filmmaker. It's not to... Um, put my opinions forth at all. But I, I did go ahead um, and ask several filmmakers who I know, who've all received grants, um, what they would like to ask of these panelists if they were not in the position of having to ask them for money. And there were several questions that popped up, and I'm going to start this off with those. And then we will open this up to general questions. When we do open it up to general questions, I know that there will probably be a lot of them. Please make them questions. Don't make them pitches, because this is not an appropriate place to pitch. Do that afterwards. Do it elsewhere. Um, I'll stop you. Uh, and uh, if you make a, you know, a question about a specific project that you have in mind. OK, so the first question. And I, I don't want to even address this to any one of you because I think probably it, it goes to all of you. Um, you all uh, go from festival to festival. You see each other frequently. You talk about projects. You talk about what it is that you're doing. How much do you think you influence each other in deciding on whether a project will or will not get funding from your institution or from your foundation? Right on down the line. I think that um, if people are enthusiastic about projects or filmmaking teams, that definitely... Speak into the mic, please. I think if um, people are enthusiastic about stories or filmmaking teams, that adds to your experience. But I think... Although we, sound, we, although we sound very similar in what we're looking for, we all have slightly different tastes, slightly different interests. We, 
we're looking for slightly different things. We may have funded a film the year before that might be slightly similar, so we're looking for something different. So I think it does help in the round, but I like to think we make our own decisions. And what, is, what specifically are your biases or tastes then? I mean, it, it literally changes as to what you have funded the year before, what you may be looking for, what captures your imagination. Um, you may really want to support a specific filmmaker doing something very difficult because you think they have extraordinary talent. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think anything can capture your imagination. Okay. Um, a few things. Um, one, I would say we do see each other a lot and we all talk together. We also meet and talk and are influenced by filmmakers and journalists and others. I think all of us inherently will um, recommend projects that we are very enthusiastic about, sometimes even projects that don't fit with our remit or our mission, but might fit with some of our colleagues or friends from around the globe. I also think we, in a positive way, or I believe, self-censor, and if it's a project that we didn't particularly like, we don't necessarily say that. We, we're, that would be something that's more for whatever reason, that we're sharing of the positive, the things that are out there, the things that maybe didn't work for us, but may work with them. We also, as Adele and I just forgot, a lot of us work together unofficially, and a lot of the funds work together officially. Um, the Cine Reach and Sundance has um, a, a, a fund that works together for um, a kind of fast tracking, if there's a kind of crisis situation. And we work together of how we decide and how we choose those projects for it, and then it is a, a grant from Cine Reach and Sundance. I think we also try to help if we're out of round um, because of deadlines and there's a project we really see could use a help from Tribeca or one of the other funds, we'll call each other and say, actually, you know, Jose or Ryan, we're kind of late right now, but there's this wonderful filmmaker from Guatemala that it didn't quite work for us, but we're thinking it might work for you. And so I think it's a way that sometimes filmmakers don't even know that we really are pushing other projects forward. I, I do think that happens a lot. Fair enough. Um, to, to put a little bit of a different spin on that now, uh, do you think that there's a chance, for example, if there are 10 of you and eight of you have passed on a project, that the la last two might pick it up? Is there a chance? Let someone else answer. Sure. Yeah. Can I come in here? Yes, we please. Are, we are a little bit different. Yeah. Yet. yeah. World Views, the 418 as it is today, uh, films we funded, um, the core of those through the PDF, which Marion Simpson over there manages, if you want to stand so everybody can see Marion, um, they all go out to independent evaluation. Each film that comes to us is then sent to a pool of evaluators that don't get paid. They don't work for a broadcaster currently. They are usually one documentary maker of experience, uh, somebody who's interested in the wider world, and one other. What is interesting is, is that, and, and I actually, I know Becky, but I don't really know, and we've partnered with Rebecca, we've partnered with Sundance for very specific reasons in specific regions. But actually, we've all funded very much the same films. So that's quite interesting that, that our independent pool is selecting very often the films that the other panel members are funding. The only thing I do want to add, because it was very specifically, if a project doesn't get funding, say from eight, could it get from the last two? First of all, I think, at least I can tell from the experience with Sundance, we often get a project that has applied to us at different stages m more than twice. And sometimes on the third time, the project has so developed and become stronger from input from us or others or filmmakers, it does get funded the third time. That's not unusual at all. So it's not a bias that if it's first um, received and not as strong as we think it's at a stage to be developed that it couldn't be funded for us. And again, I also think it can get funded by others. Um, Becky, you have something to answer, to add here? Yeah, I'm just lucky to work, I think, with Bertha Foundation in the sense that we're very flexible, and if they see a film that might make a huge difference in a small community, in a small place, um, we're happy to fund it if, even if no one else is going near because we all have different ultimate goals mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do. So, so we oftentimes uh, would go in on a film that that no one no one else would, or people have already passed, but it doesn't matter because it's close to the heart of what you know, what you know, what we're what we're after. Yeah. Adela, you yeah. had. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to jump in here too. Um, Cinereach um, funds from development through post-production, um, and so a lot of the projects that we give <laughs> grants to, um, especially over the last couple of years, are really uh, purely in development, which means they might have very, very little footage um, with fiction films, just a script. Um, and in that sense, we're not afraid of being the first money in on a project and taking that risk because we know that once we help that project develop that they can go to the other funders that do focus on post-production or just production funds. Um, but in terms of speaking to each other, um, I, I think part of it is about relationship building and um, when we give a grant to a project, it's a long-term relationship with a filmmaker. Um, so it's not just about here's the check, goodbye, we'll see you later. Um, and sometimes you want to talk to other organizations to find out if they've had a relationship with this filmmaker and what that has been like. Because in that way, you can understand a little bit how that person works. Um, we can team up together and say maybe we can both help this person overcome some obstacles. So it is also not just about the project, but about the relationship you build with the filmmaker. So. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and just to echo Adela, um, we also like partner up with CineReach a lot in informal fashions, but we, if you kind of take a look at CineReach roster of funded projects and ours, like there's a lot of crossover. And at the same time, it's kind of thing, it's subliminally, like we just cater towards the same type of subject matter. Other times we deviate. And I think to the question of, you know, if, if a majority kind of passes on a project and then the last two, would they come on board, I think so, because I think we're all in this business because we love film and, and we all kind of share very similar attitudes and feelings and tastes. But at the same time, so when, when most of our tastes are aligned, every one of us has their own personal taste that we separate from our profession. Mm -hmm. So that's when those personal tastes take, take like kind of control. And I think those two projects will find an audience because everybody has very eccentric things that can contribute to. Um, so, uh, you mentioned that you you know you you develop relationships. Um, a question that comes out of that then is, uh, how much are you influenced by um, a filmmaker's track record, name recognition, and or reputation for being willing to get out and sell the film once it's done? Are you influenced by that in any way? I, I think it's, a, it's not just a one piece of the, the pie. I mean, there are a lot of factors that go into play here. And when but we this are, is one piece. It's is, one, it, is it a factor that you take into consideration? Sure, but it's, you know, it's, it's one piece of the pie. I mean, as she said, maybe we funded other films by this person in the past, and maybe we think we want to give support to somebody else this time around. Or maybe... Um, you know, they are a lone wolf and um, we're, you know, we're interested in if they come into obstacles, who are they going to reach out to and how are they going to overcome those obstacles to get the film done? I mean, those all play into our decision-making process. Victoria, you had something? Yeah, and often people are first-time filmmakers. Into the, need, into the mic, please. Often people are first-time filmmakers and need that initial support and foundations can often come in there because broadcasters, if people have a track record, it's easier access, whereas for first-time filmmakers, they might need a bit more of a help that we could provide. Okay, to follow, for us, yeah, go ahead. We have a very, each round that we have of our core funding, then uh, we make sure there's a real spread. Um, and, you know, since 2008, we've been running workshops in, in, in Africa um, and Asia, and we make sure that we always get some of those films that do need 24-7 mentoring, and we bring those on, because the whole idea is worldviews like a ladder, and we bring people from short films right the way through to funding for big docs. Um, in terms of uh, accessibility, obviously if you've got a name, if you've got a track record, the accessibility is greater. For those who are just starting out, they have the opportunity to look at a form that is to be uh, submitted to you. And the form is a formula. If they do not feel strong in their career and what they, what they envision for themselves, that they don't have that kind of track record that they know of and self-confidence that that builds. Do you feel that there's a danger that fitting into your form might influence their perspective, their, their artistic expression in some way? How do you guard against that? I, I think there are a number of kind of incubator programs and... Is it, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I think there are a number of incubator programs, labs, uh, summer schools that, that give you a chance to take up the level of your project before applying to foundations mm -hmm. like us. Um, I don't think the form is a formula. I think if you put your unique voice into that project, if, if you've got a particular perspective on a story, communicate that within our 250 words that you've got to fill in. It doesn't, doesn't influence the way that the film comes out, I don't think. These are, th remember, these are questions that are coming from filmmakers. Mm. So filmmakers, I, I, th I think to add to that, I mean, we're ultimately, all of us, all of these funds are supporting film or video projects. We're not supporting a, a journalistic or, or a novel. So even if you have an incredibly beautiful proposal, but your visual material really doesn't live up to the, the proposal, the written proposal, or have its own style and um, force, that then there's a disconnect. I mean, ultimately we want to judge and assess and work with the person who's got um, a storytelling ability in sound and, and, and vision and, and music and composition and editing. So it's a very different medium. I mean, we also, I stress a lot, and Syed could say that the proposal has to be um, well written in that it engages the reader. And I often say that you can write it in the language that is your most comfortable, and then work with a very good friend who has English as a good language, barter a, a dinner or, or something together, and have it well, not Google translated, but well presented in the English language, because that's what most of us are reading. It doesn't have to be long, it just has to really get through in text the essence of what you're trying to tell in your visual storytelling and audio storytelling. Okay, Adela and then, and then Jose. I, I also wanted to jump in here about the um, review process and that, um, you know, we also have an independent uh, panel um, in the second stage of the, of the application process and um, it's a very subjective experience. We have certain criteria, but we can have, we have a rating system and we can have one reviewer who's a, another filmmaker, professional, filmmaker give the, the project a one, and one filmmaker give the project a five. And who's right? And you know, how do you make your decisions on that? And I think that's important for filmmakers to understand when they apply, is that it's not always universal consensus. Jose? And from personal experience, what we're doing now with Tribeca is we're kind of going into uncharted territory with um, our Latin fund. Um, we have a new presenting sponsor, Bloomberg, the corporation is now our presenting, our presenting sponsor and we're doing these um, workshops throughout Latin America starting in August and what we're doing is we're doing these two-day collaborative labs starting in August then two in October um, and the reasoning behind this, these labs were because there we saw kind of a gap or a weakness in filmmakers from Latin America applying and through no fault of their own obviously their English is not as strong but when you read, when you see such a strong sample, and you see that the talent, the vision is there, but they they're just not able to pitch a story well, or they think that a tagline is a logline. Certain things that you really want to, even though they're not going to get the grant for whatever reason, you really do want to support them. We're going to un like unleash and initiate these labs starting in August, where we're selecting projects. Um, we're going to uh, delve into pitch delivery and structure, how to write a treatment, how to write a sample. Um, and obviously the intention would be as we grow to keep doing these um, throughout the world. You know, Ryan, my, the director of doc programming, goes to the Greenhouse Forum every year um, and he does a derivation of that and he does, you know, he helps people, give, f gives feedback to Mediterranean filmmakers. So that's the intention that hopefully this, the film funding world doesn't, do, doesn't just stay as a just as, as a grant and that's it, it becomes like full on, like on the ground kind of mentorship and support. Um, slightly different subject uh, and probably more applicable to uh, Brit Doc and, uh, and Tribeca. You have grants or funds that are branded. How much or how do you prevent actually uh, influence from the brand uh, to be exerted on your either decision making and or the films that are selected? Um, for us, I mean, uh, we've been very fortunate in that we found really great partners and they 
they provide the support and they entrust us enough that we can focus on curating every year our submissions, whether it's Gucci for our social issue driven fund or Bloomberg. Bloomberg has just come on board and they've been a partner uh, with us for the past 10 years. They used to um, be sponsors of the Tribeca All Access program, but because they, they felt the need to kind of migrate over to another interest and, and help another another kind of array of filmmakers so they we you know we pitched the Latin fund to them and they've that's kind of not that's kind of foreign territory for for them in terms of you know educa you, film education do you look into a corporation's background and see what its uh, its record is on issues that might for example be covered uh, in these films I mean do you do you check it all into that I mean there is there is there okay, a possible I conflict you, um, I've worked at Human Rights Watch for 16 years, and actually um, Gucci is one of the um, uh, clothing industries that actually has a very good record. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our human rights and corporate responsibility. Gucci, I remember telling Ryan that, we're very happy to hear. It, so Gucci does. I can speak about that. The other... Yeah, that, that's one example, I mean, but there are others that, that pop up that are perhaps not as... But successful their in their sponsor. practice. Right, right, yeah. I mean, okay, the, I'll, I'll accept that. I just wanted to raise it as a question because it was it was also put forth to me by filmmakers. Um, another qu uh, question that came uh, from a lot of people, and it's not a particularly polite question, but I do hope that you'll answer it. Uh, there were questions raised about how much of your income, of the, the foundation's income, actually goes to the sponsorship of projects and how much of it goes towards the administration and or other elements within uh, the uh, foundation's uh, business. Um, this was a question that came up a lot. Um, so I, I open it up. I mean, I could point to specific examples of what people said, but I'm, I'm not going to do that because that would be just too rude. But um, if you don't mind, would you answer, please? Yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy to, to also. I mean, um, our administration costs are around, Into the mic, please. Our, our, our administration costs are uh, well under 30%. Uh, most of it has to go into awards. One of the reasons people actually haven't known quite so much about us, perhaps even compared to BritDoc in, in recent years, is we have no marketing budget. We have no PR budget. So actually, the fact we exist has been through coming to festivals and meeting people. And now our global move has been through partnerships with Sundance and Tribeca. But that's, that's, we have a very small team who administer very many grants. Just, and just to give you a... a brief idea I'm from Bertha but our film fund uh, giving is just about a quarter of our media giving um, and we have four film funds and there's just me working on that with um, the family that that started the Bertha Foundation so we're pretty much it's it's pretty much all going um, to the projects same uh, in fact we had a discussion at the Hartley Film Foundation there's staff of two and a board of 11 we had a discussion about whether um, we should do some major fundraising to keep our endowment intact or whether we spend down slowly to zero but fulfill the mission that we've been given. Um, so far we're maintaining a little bit down, 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 but just a little, and that's where we are. The, the, the mission is so clearly to uh, support the documentary filmmakers, so our administration fees are minimal. And uh, <clears throat> I set up and everything that I've raised philanthropically I've put into film. There are two of us and we both work for free and we all do so for our first two years. So, you know, we don't even charge for our travel to Sheffield. So, <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, the others, please, uh, pitch in, everybody. I'd like an answer from all of them. That's one for, for us, we... The Latin Fund was one of our kind of lesser funded funds, but across the board, almost everything I would say about a, you know, 
85%, most of it goes straight straight to the fun, to the filmmakers. And actually we, you know, through, whether it's Gucci Fund or Latin Fund, we actually go back to our sponsors to kind of renegotiate because we want to, because we're doing these workshops in Latin America or even workshops here, like initial mentorship talks with filmmakers, we, we consistently go back to our sponsors and get more money just because we can increase the the. Is the there grant. any place where your figures are posted where people can look this up? Yes. Uh, there are foundation center online for the 501c3 nonprofits where we have our form 990, our tax forms are, and that's true for a lot yeah. of these funding. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. All all the true, true across the line. Okay, so that's fine. And and any other? Yeah, open it up. Yeah, yeah. Open that it was up. the so last question that I had to ask on behalf of my friend filmmakers. Now all of you uh, questions, please. So there's and a microphone there, just please you put up your hand. The microphone until you ask your question. And also, again, remember, please no uh, personal pitches at this moment. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the guy in the blue plaid shirt. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, when you go back to your trustees, uh, how do they judge success? Is it by impact or by audience or what is it they want to see? I mean, for us, it's usually, yeah, the audience, if the audience is the reception of, of the film. Um, in terms of the exposure, um, how many markets it's tapping into. Um, I mean, it's for our track record, track record usually isn't necessarily like theatrical success or, but it's more like has the film landed an audience and is it making, is it creating social discourse, whether it's a social issue driven film or a more kind of eccentric, unconventional project that came through our character driven fund. So it's, it's mirrored depending on the, you know, the exposure, whether it's large scale theatrical or, or more, more specific niche. niche. To, to kind of um, uh, push further on what Jose is saying, I would say probably Sundance, the funders as well as trustees have similar, some of the um, reporting back is similar, but it's also individual to the particular film and project because sometimes a particular film or project, there was a targeted audience that the, the filmmaker really pr propositioned to get to with his or her film, whether there was a film we um, supported a number of years ago called Camp Victory, which is about the Afghan and US military and the withdrawal and what was happening with the training. There's an incredibly wonderful plan that the filmmaker had was how to affect the US military and its training and understanding of the Afghan military. And that was through very, very targeted screenings for military US, both in the US and also um, overseas globally. So her reporting back was something that could have never been done with large scale screenings and other places. The film also had a wonderful life on public television, et cetera. But so there's sometimes very specific long tail stories that come out of each project that supported as well. So I think augmenting with the publicity and the kind of general release the film has. That's something that's greatly appreciated by the supporters of Sundance. Um, I, yes, the lady with the lovely blonde hair, white hair, <laughs> white blonde hair. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm here with Women Make Movies and I also am a filmmaker and I would be interested to know from each of the panelists, um, what I'm finding is that more and more funders are asking for particularly digital rights uh, in exchange for their contributions uh, to the films, and that does have effects on the filmmakers in terms of our potential for distribution and recouping any kind, uh, monetizing any kind of value. So I'd be curious what these different funds feel about that and what their policies are in terms of rights Good. and what you ask for. Um, Down the line. We grant soft money so we don't, sorry, we grant soft money so we don't take any rights. We recoup after you've paid the cleaner. So um, once everyone's been paid on the project, then we would like to get our grant back so we can give it to other needy films. But um, no, we don't take any rights. Sundance doesn't take any rights and it's a grant. Um. <laughs> Uh, same thing for Cinereach. We don't take any rights on the grant side, and um, it's soft money, so we don't expect it to come back. 
Same for Worldview. We don't take any rights position and uh, we presume you're not going to make a... We don't take any rights and we presume you're not going to make a profit. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Same for us. Um, what we ask at the very least is that the filmmaker every 10, 12 weeks send a, sends us status updates and financial updates, but we don't, it's, the grant's yours and you can, you know, finish your film hopefully. That's the same for us, though we do ask for the non-exclusive right to be able to screen the finished product um, theatrically in Weaver have a theater in London. Um. Same for us other than the, the Channel 4 fund, which is the one specifically for British filmmakers. Uh, Channel 4 has a first look option on that to broadcast it and to buy it for one pound. Um, we don't take any rights either. Um, we do look to recoup the money. depends on, um, obviously, the, 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 the number of different organisations involved and the, and the sort of complexities of the financing structure, um, but that's mainly so that we can, you know, ensure that we keep funding films. You had your hand up right away. Yes, please. I'm not asking questions. Uh, I just want to introduce my uh, foundation, which Bruni just mentioned. It's Cinex. Uh, it's a Chinese-based uh, foundation. I think it's one of the very few uh, foundation in Chinese societies that uh, support teen Great. documentary. Uh, we have two different. Uh, <laughs> we have. <laughs> thank you. We have the Cinex uh, 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 annual pitching, uh, which we give uh, real money but it's uh, focused on the Chinese uh, topic, and uh, if you have uh, any project uh, which is a Chinese I issue and uh, you work with a Chinese director... What is the name of the foundation? CNEX, C-N-E-X. And you have a website? Yes. Write it down, C-N-E-X dot com. Dot org. Dot org, sorry. And your name is? W dot C-N-E-X dot org dot C-N. What is your name, sir? My name is Chao Wei, Chang Chao Wei. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm the co-founder and the yeah. chief producer of the, of the foundation. And the other, the other uh, I want to give some more information for the filmmakers. Can you, can you, can you just give them the website? Because there, there are a lot of questions okay. here. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, but and another website is CCDF. It's a pitching okay. column. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, blue shirt here. I was hoping for a hair compliment, but fair enough. Um, in terms of when you're assessing projects, um, if it's obviously from a first time filmmaker, you've got no track record to look at. So what would be the minimum you'd kind of ask for, you know, synopsis, trailer? I mean, is there, mm -hmm. you know, X amount of things you would want? And obviously if it's, say, if it's about a, a person in particular that you'd want kind of LOIs or some attachments, you know, how much do you need and how much is too much, I guess? As a first-time filmmaker, I think the most important thing is to have an experienced exec team with you, so you know that someone can, it will help you realize the film you want to make. Um, I think I would be interested in seeing anything at any stage, as long as you have a, a treatment and a synopsis, and even some pictures are enough. You don't have to have a, tra a trailer necessarily, but um, I think it's about building a supportive team around you as a first-time filmmaker. No, it's great advice that Victoria gave. I would just add for Sundance, because the reality is the competition is so ferocious, and we get per cycle probably 900 applications, possibly more, at least half development, if not more, that um, strong but short uh, proposal is good, but as much strong, succinct visual material you can send. So a trailer is good, but additional scenes, if at all possible. So, sorry, just so, so, sure. Like Either a character five, study, up to say five or eight minutes, or um, uh, one or two scenes that are showing the drama that's unfolding. That is a lot, so I'm just saying you asked what's the maximum, so I, I wanted to be, be honest about Thank that. You. Um, for Cinereach and development funding, we, we do provide a lot of first-time filmmakers with yeah. grants. Um, you know, we fund both documentary and fiction, and as Bruni said, it's very competitive. Uh, last cycle, we had over 2,000 applications, and uh, we gave to 22 projects. Um, many of them were in development stage, but just to give you an idea of how competitive it is. Um, and then, you know, there have been films that don't have any visual material, um, and that we've given grants to, but that's actually, because it's so competitive, quite rare. So 
Um, we, we require that you submit a letter of inquiry with some visual material. If you have even a couple of minutes, that helps us understand your style. Um, we've got varied approaches um, for UK filmmakers or if we're working in our workshops around the world, then uh, we like to try and meet you and sit down with you, particularly if you're a first time filmmaker. Um, but we also have our Your Worldview platform where we encourage people to just upload their films, short films, and then we're often picking from there who we will then go and meet and train and, and bring on. But we often fund first time filmmakers. Uh, narrative, uh, brief, uh, compelling, paced, so we can see that you can write. Um, a sample of past work because we're only seed funding and often there's literally no visuals, so we have to know that you have production value. And um, um, a budget, a projected budget that includes a salary for you so that we know you're gonna be hanging by your fingernails through the entire process, but we keep getting budgets where there's no money for the filmmaker, which is rather um, unrealistic when you're going into four, five, six years of filming on a project. So we look for that as well. For us, a written application, um, a treatment, um, and then a sample footage. But for us, it needs to be of the current work. And we accept a minimum of seven minutes, even if it's late in development or in development. We accept projects in development, but they need to have at least seven minutes. Um, but black and white, it should be the, the sample footage. If the sample footage is really strong and you're a first time filmmaker, you, if you grab us there, I mean, well, we'll obviously read everything else, but you, you in my opinion, you have half of the battle won. Um, for us, it's different for the varying funds. So we try to be flexible. We have given uh, development funds w without having seen any footage, but based on what's written. Um, but so for us, it varies. Um, <laughs> I was going to give you a hair compliment just to cheer you <laughs> no, up. No, you just shave. Oh, <laughs> nice, nice facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, with us also it varies on with each fund. We they they are you fill in forms online, so they are kind of formatted, but they're not formulaic. In a sense, you you do have space to to write your own synopsis in there. Um, the Pima Catalyst Award, uh, if you're applying for development, uniquely you can apply without any imagery. Um, but we will now the process is you apply with a letter of interest, and we'll ask for a bit more information. We are able to support first-time filmmakers. We, we like supporting first-time filmmakers. I mean, it's kind of hooray. part of hooray. Um, I mean, really for us, it's about, you know, because we're coming in on post, we really do look at it in terms of what you send us. So it's a combination of does the, does the footage that you have, you know, keep it short, you know, a trailer or scene. Um, you know, we can tell whether we think it's going to, to work through that and through your treatment. And, you know, as long as, you know, I think if you're a first-time filmmaker, it does really, really help to have a really good production entity behind you, be that sort of producer or production company, um, just so that we can ensure, you know, that it is going to be delivered. But in terms of your vision, I think, you know, you, you, you know we judge it on what we see, and it's the same for a first-time filmmaker as it would be for an established filmmaker, to be honest. Um, we, we, I got a, an orange light there, which means that I have, what, Three minutes, two minutes, five minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, you and then you. Okay. Oh, and there's one more. Oh no, we, we're not going to run out of time. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, hello, I'm just wondering what, if any, position you take on the involvement of charitable organisations within a project. I'm thinking not in terms of funding, but in terms of facilitating access or possibly even being part of the story. Is it problematic in any way at all? Um, probably not, possibly, depending, depending on what it looks like. Um, I would say it would definitely not put us off, but we would have to, it, it would be part of our exploring the projects process. Yeah, I think that's a very good way to put it. Um, it certainly couldn't be that, that the organization had given you money that would be seen as an advocacy piece for the organization. Um, sometimes there can be main characters or also a big part of my work at Sundance is to connect the filmmaker with the appropriate people to do the research work on a particular human rights issue. But it's not that that person's going to be interviewed or be in the film. So I think it's really case by case and the nuance that it's to help, the, to assist the filmmaker with their independent and critical um, storytelling. That would be another way to put it. 
Um, okay, uh, jump to this gentleman here. Sorry. Hi everyone, I try to keep it short. I'm a filmmaker from um, Morocco, quite connected with um, African filmmakers. And um, I've been in a couple of festivals. I know majority of you guys and your associations. But <coughs> however, back in my country and in Africa, not many filmmakers know even what a funding is. And I was gonna propose something or ask if that could be possible to kind of create like little fundings for guys like me to go back and then just share, you know, just share that with people because many potential talented filmmakers just don't know how, you know, go a step further. So, and it's a shame, so. A good idea, yeah. One of the projects we've done this year is we funded seven African researchers to go to 54 countries in Africa to, um, to talk and figure out the landscape of documentary filmmaking in African countries in the hopes that if an African fund can be set up to support African documentary films for African documentary filmmakers, what the actual needs would be. So we felt first we needed to understand what the needs were on the ground before the recommendations for how that fund would look like. So happy to talk to you more about, about that. And the, the paper is gonna be released um, for free for everyone uh, at the beginning of July. Last question, a pressing desire of something that you can't live without. Yes, go ahead, your hand is up. It's been up for a while. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, deadlines and how much flexible you are uh, on deadlines. <laughs> because, <laughs> because many times we have um, partly funded a film and we have to respect deadlines with, TV, with broadcasters, and it doesn't match. What can we do? Are you talking about, sorry, deadlines for delivery or deadlines for our Deadline, open Deadlines calls? for applying. I guess you have deadlines and you cannot take uh, proposals whenever. You, you must have, I, I guess. Uh, I mean, to speak to the Cinereach process, we used to have two grant, grant deadlines a year. Um, every six months, um, and we would make decisions within three months. So filmmakers would, would often be able to reapply in the next cycle and not that much time had passed. Um, but what happens to us with our small office is that we are basically doing grant cycles all year round with no time in between. So the moment you made your decisions, you open the next one, and that's not very healthy maybe for the organization. Um, and so we decide to put it into one cycle a year, but unfortunately that means that, you know, you have to wait eight months until the next cycle comes around. And, um, you know, part of the advantage of doing that is you see a breadth of projects. There could be four films about the Egyptian Revolution or the Arab Spring, or there could be four films about immigration in Mexico. And if you don't have the open call application process, it's hard to see all of those films together. So th there are pros and cons to doing a discretionary open call rolling application versus deadlines, but you have to, you know, yeah. And for us, um, we have two submission cycles, but it, we only have one submission cycle for each fund, you know? So we have one where, where like three of our funds open and then a second submission cycle for, another, for our fourth fund. Um, and I think that's a good question. And, you know, one of the questions that is asked usually in panels like this is, what, what should you tell people to apply? If you, want, if you could instill something to people that are going to apply, what should it be? And, like, please don't email us on the day we close. Like, you know, on the deadline, it's usually like asking a, like, a barrage of questions. And like for us, we're usually, we're open to, for two months. And like, I mean, we'll obviously answer your question the day of, but there's so much time to and email us about things that the last day is like, ugh, you know, we have to juggle a lot more. Um, but it, we really are flexible, I mean, um, you know, given the situation, we try to sometimes whether it's you know our system crashing and then we give you like a like an, a 24-hour like extension. Um, even last year, we closed the week that Sandy hit, that Hurricane Sandy hit. So you, you were not in the office, and as you can imagine, like over 80 emails. You know, a lot of people just dealing with the issue, and that's obviously a r ridiculous situation that we had to address head on. But on the on the whole, we're very flexible. It it all depends on your situation and if it's valid, and you know. Catherine, 
I just wanted to say, I mean, we, we take a different, we obviously take a very, a very different approach. We actually work on a rolling basis, but I think the thing with us is that um, you can, you can obviously sort of send your materials to us at any time, but it's best to wait till you're actually ready because, you know, we're, we're coming in at post. We know that projects, you know, projects sort of, they reach that point at different times of the year and we want to be able to kind of move quite quickly on things. Um, but, you know, obviously we receive a lot of things that aren't quite at the stage yet. So it is really a case of, you know, we'll, we'll sort of get a lot of things in and then we'll, we'll see when something's right for us and we'll be able to move quite quickly on it. Um, so, we, we, you know, we work slightly differently, I think, to a lot of people. Rolling admission. Yeah. Uh, Together. Go ahead. <laughs> a fight, a fight. Sorry. Let's <laughs> arm wrestle this. We need a Medusa microphone. <laughs> um, yeah. All of our funds, other than the Berthabert.connect fund, are rolling funds. Berthabert.connect fund has two deadlines per year, and um, I echo my panelists with the don't apply on the last day before deadline, and then try and up, yeah, try and upload something and, and send <laughs> lots of questions. Try just if you have a three-month window, start your application early, and then you can address any problems. Um, the Puma Catalyst Award and Berthabert Doc Journalism fund are particularly able to address urgency with projects. If you're out in the field and you need finance quite quickly, you, you can address that in the application. Um, they can provide catalytic finance. And just, just to say that the deadlines for us aren't arbitrary, and I'm sure for none of the panelists, but it's that we convene decision makers to make decisions on the project, so it's hard to get everyone together, and so those are set dates, so that's why we have to have them in by a certain time so that they're ready to be presented to whoever it is that's ultimately going to be making the final decisions with us. I mean, even it just makes common sense. All of these deadlines and all of these regulations are on websites. These are, have all have very, very well developed and, and very helpful websites that I think should be really um, looked at and studied. Uh, and you'll find a lot of answers to questions like those at that. Uh, at, at, that's the resource for those, the answers to those questions. Um, I think uh, we're red, so that means Red. Good night, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> a round of applause for our great panelists, Jennifer Mary, thank the chair. Thank you very much for coming.